I'm the head of community for Consortium 9. With me today as part of our Meet the Team series is Fred. Now, wait a second, because I used to work with a bunch of Icelanders. So the Nordic culture is not unfamiliar to me. So you're Swedish. Do you say Jonsson? Johansson? Because here we would say Johnson. Johnson is fine. Okay, so your role on the team is that you are the uh, head of art and games, right? Yeah, I, I guess. Like, uh, well, head of art is what it says on LinkedIn. and But I'm also alongside the, the team we're building, obviously, the, the game department and alongside with Brooks, I think have the most experience from actually making games, um, constructing them, hands-on, in leadership positions, and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, I wouldn't say head of games, but... Um, well, that's that's what's on my notes. <laughs> let's 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 go with that, and because okay. you know, at one at one at one point, I I would want to have a discussion about what is games and what is art. You know, uh, where yeah. do they you know overlap and stuff we, like that? Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that, but first, let's talk about uh, where you've been and how you got here. You've worked on some really high profile projects in the past some some really well known games but those aren't necessarily games that you thought were done well so you want to talk about like you know splinter cell what you did there and rainbow 6 and why those aren't necessarily the best games that you've worked on uh, i worked on chaos theory i was doing level art uh, and it was Amazing in many aspects, you know, uh, playing with light and shadow and working with fantastic people and uh, Ubisoft Montreal having like a lot of muscle. Um, but for me personally, maybe not the most creative games, not the games that I do enjoy the most to play. Um so what does it mean, the best, you know? Is best maybe in the eye of the beholder? So, you know, hmm. while they were financially and commercially successful, you thought that there were things that they could have done better, right? To, is no, I think they I think they did perfectly fine for that audience, you know. But I wasn't the I wasn't the audience. Like I, I enjoyed the, the, the smaller games we made before I joined uh the triple A industry, coming okay. to Montreal, working at Ubisoft. They were more creative. We had less money, we had less people, but we were more experimental. And it was like maybe it was more creative, you know. Um though but I think both those games are fantastic also from something that I try to, um, I, I do want to bring it to what we're doing now when we're building a culture of making uh, games, building the teams is to establish autonomy. And this is something that I, you know, I can't complain. I think that at the time, this was um, almost 20 years ago, uh, Ubisoft Montreal, they they created, they allowed us artists to have a lot of autonomy. We could, we had a lot of ownership of the 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 worlds that we created, the levels that we created, and we had a lot a lot of good um, conversation about what is games and and I think very good principles in general. You know, the uh, it was always about the experience, the user experience, which I which I kind of like. Uh, I, I've been trying to bring that also to a lot of other studios. I've been, you know, um, after having worked for Ubisoft, like, you know, like it's not about what I, what I want, like me as a game developer, I always, um, I, it, sometimes it overlaps. Like I am the customer, but you do want to, you know, try to avoid your own biases and your own, like, I like this, so I think this is beautiful, all right, that stuff. that's so, such yeah. a pitfall with a lot of games, you know, the vision, don't deviate from the vision. Well, 
Mm. You you have to play to your audience. You have to play to your consumers, and you can't be all precious about those ideas. Let's let's roll it back a little bit. Let's talk about little Fred. When when <laughs> you were little, what did you want to be when you grow up, and how did you go from that to getting into the game industry? Cool. Um, I think I'm looking back. And I'm just I'm 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 gonna be 50 soon, so I I, I don't think I'm done. I want to be making games till I die, whenever that is. But um, I mean, I grew up in Pippi Longstocking country, right? She would be you know like sleeping with her feet on the pillow. She would be like breaking all the rules. She would be breaking all the rules, and she could like take care of herself. She's a strong character and i like that and so i grew up with that and lego you know and when you build lego you get i think that you develop a sense of you know you build shit and it's all systemic and it's like creative and you 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 may be the first one it's like why we are so good with you know assembling ikea furniture because you you follow the you know the the blueprints and all that stuff and you build it, then you blow it up or you tear it down and you rebuild it into something new. We create a world at home, me and my brothers. And uh, I mean, all my friends, all of us, like in, in the seventies and the, and the early eighties. So yeah, that, that, that was part of it. It's like playing with that, like with your imagination, I, something that my mom also encouraged. Um, so, and that, plus music after that and, and, stuff so how did i get in the industry because i've been so lucky i've been just like going from one like happy sort of like a happy accident to the next i think it was like this like it, when i was studying i was studying like architecture and, and construction engineering upper secondary you know and and this was 92 93 in the computer lab there was a I found like a box. It was all dusty. Nobody had opened it. And it's like it's a 3D studio. I was like, because we were doing like AutoCAD stuff, you know, building, you know, drawing uh, plans and blueprints and pretty boring stuff. But, yeah. So I found that thing and nobody used it. And I was like, I was curious again, curious. And I, I asked my teacher, like, hey, what's this thing? And I, I I I installed it and I started to understand what what the hell this is something new this is like this is another dimension this is like three dimensions the hell what can I do with this so I got super you know excited about that and ended up doing you know I, I ended up at an architecture company in the middle of like where I'm at now as well I'm back I'm almost I'm I'm back where I started actually in the same room. Um, growing up but uh the i ended up at the architecture company that also they also sold this tool and i got to use it so i used it on like big architecture um products and i did like renders and animations and stuff like that obviously the business wasn't around this is early but I, I, I was like, I, I, I felt like this was awesome, and I was started to look around. What can I do? Can I be? Can I start my own company? And I, I realized I needed a bigger computer because I had, I had borrowed my older brother's, you know, Pentium, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I called around and I figured like I, I want one of those SGIs, you know, the ones that they use to do like VFX or films, you know. At, ILM and other places. And I called around and there's one place up north where they actually sold them. So I called them and said, like, hey, how much is it? Like it was fucking expensive, obviously. But it turned out that those guys also had started a little gaming company called Daydream. And they said, okay, but we're looking for people. Do you do 3D? Because this is like pretty early, right? And so I ended up joining them. I moved up north, uh, even further up north, even colder, you know, even less sun <laughs> uh in winter more in summer and i stayed there for you know seven years and we transitioned from pre-rendered to real-time rendered and and like i said that was before coming to, like to the big companies uh you know ubisoft but you know still we we did multiplayer shit like I, I still have a T-shirt somewhere around in this house. I can't find it, but it says like one of the games that we made 
23 years ago said like it's not a game it's a sport because we had realized we had internet in sweden you know we had really awesome internet in sweden early on um now yeah the national digital strategy sucks but you know that back then it was good and so we had internet and we figured this is going to change the world this is going to change everything and we wanted to make games that connected people you know communities and and compete and like like what is sports in the digital era we were doing that so maybe that's why i kind of like when we when we made like a game like splinter cell which is awesome in its own little bubble like you play with you know it's not a big idea it's not like it's not going to re- revolutionize like what is sport and stuff like that so um yeah that's how i got there you know we started a company that the first one just crashed and because it, w- it was part of the the bubble the internet or the uh, it bubble whatever it was called like back then like 2002 or something just you know exploded so we started another company called coldwood interactive and like recently they've had a huge success with unravel it's like the cutest ever like cutest game ever but yeah i was there then like for some reason i got picked up by ubisoft in montreal and that was my you know i was i was curious again i was curious to see what is it to do games with a big budget and I got there and I had a blast for three years. Um, again, like Splinter Cell was, you know, board, the, the, the coolest technology that you could have. I, was, I remember I was so excited about um, reflections, doing proper reflections in the game. That was new to me. So like I, I pushed that uh, where I could and, and also like paint the worlds and the spectrums that are our stupid eyes are kind of, you know, not great, you know, our human eyes. So like playing with, you know, different visions like heat or, you know, electromagnetic stuff, that's kind of interesting. That like, that was almost like, you know, the, the first games that we did at Daydream, they were uh, adventure games, point and click adventures, like, you know, open a safe and you look for a clue and stuff like that. So I felt like when we did, when we did like the exciting bit of doing the, the, the Splinter Cell games was like using those tools to like look through the world or through the camera, like in a different way. And like the way you could put clues, like the cameras would have these, you know, wires. And so if you swap to that, you know, to that view mode, now you see the w- wires and that's like a clue. And that that's interesting. And it made me really want to explore you know, what are the ways that we, we see, um, reality right not not just in 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 view spectrum but also in time you know and how do we perceive the world and how like yeah i I, you know it it was just cool okay so yeah you did all of those things somewhere along the line you met brooks because brooks is really like the warp thread and this tapestry Mm -hmm. of c9 like at some point somebody met brooks and then he brought yeah. them on board building his dream team. So how do you fit into mm. that tapestry? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the, I think I wouldn't have met, I would not have met Brooks. I wouldn't have been here had I not been to a Ubisoft because at Ubisoft, I met a guy called Clint Hawking, uh, who was the creative uh, director on Splinter Cell. And, Later, like I, I moved, I moved, I moved home. I moved back to Stockholm. I joined Avalanche. We made Just Cause Two. I was the lead artist on that, and that was also like one of those like, wow, it's awesome! Like it's like a three dimensional sandbox. That had been like a, a dream of my, like a mine also to to work on that. And while it was like pretty limiting in the in the terms of the graphics that you could push, the upside was of the technology was the streaming. So what can you do with this, you know, thing? And it was, yeah, I, I love working on Just Cause 2 um, and what we made with it. But that was like an open world. Right? So after that, I that also crashed like all games companies tend to do sooner or later. I, I ended up at Starbreeze for a couple of years and while I was working at Starbreeze, now I had like made it from 
building 3D models, doing textures to, uh, you know, even animating characters like those, you know, 25 years ago, like pretty, you know, I, I learned a lot of different things. And eventually I, you know, I was excited. I was curious about the big ideas and how can we improve how we get more people uh, to build better stuff and be autonomous and feel happy when they do it and encourage that. And uh, so when I was at Starbreeze 2010, and that was starting to like fall apart as well, um, then Clint reached out and he asked me, so I'm moving to LucasArts. I'm going to do an open world, Star Wars. So he saw that I had made Just Cause 2, which is an open world, and he had made Far Cry. So he now wanted to do another game in, in Star Wars. Um universe and he's asked me are you interested i'm like yes <laughs> very much uh, I, I i felt like it was time to do something new so yeah i i uh, took my eight months pregnant wife and we moved to san francisco uh that was stressful <laughs> but yeah that's how i met so i and, uh, again like i i came to san francisco i joined lucas arts you know what an incredible place filled with so much talent and still pretty fucked up the way that they had not very much autonomy in the, in the terms of like, we have all these creative guys and we have all the infrastructure, we have the IP, we have the money, we have the money, they had everything, but they still were kind of like, Oh, it's not going to happen. And like terrible, I think leadership then from the Lucas Films side, not at Lucas Arts. Paul Megan was a brilliant CEO. I think that they had a good good structure, and I think uh, um, a lot of them had experience from Ubisoft too. I don't know what that means, but I'm just saying it. Uh, but yeah, so I I got there. Our container, you know, arrives at San Francisco. We got the apartment. We got the kid, and the next day we got the news. Yeah, your product is on ice. Okay, so I, I was I, I remember thinking like this. Okay, so should I just like not unpack the container, like just turn around and go back, you know? Uh, but no, they they decided they wanted to keep us, you know, me and Clint and a few of the other like geniuses that that was there to create a new build a new team and build a new game within um, the universe. So after this, I got to meet Brooks because he was also stuck in that mess. And, and we, we sat around and we, we talked a lot about what is games and what is art and what, how do we make games and why do we make games? And I think that we kind of connected, like we clicked, you know, it was really fun. He was a coffee lover then like a hardcore coffee nerd, you know, like me being from coffee Sydney, I love and coffee cigarettes. Hours. Yeah. He gave them both <laughs> up, but I remember those days with Brooks. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it, it was pretty awesome. Uh, we hung out a little bit and, you know, eventually, uh, uh, well, Disney just like, Hey, yeah, this is, you know, I think it was six months later. No, it was almost two years later. I can't remember. A year and a half, let's say that. Then we got to, like, oh, okay, Disney is buying us. That's why our party was on ice because they had started negotiations, I think. Uh, and so, but like what was going to be, I was thinking this is going to be like five years of intense work on making a new game turn into like a pretty slightly boring but still interesting experience because I did get to hang out. I did get to meet, you know, uh, Brooks and a whole lot of other people that um, I still talk to today. Uh, so that was fine. And my daughter was born in San Francisco. So it's, that's, that's pretty good too. Uh, but eventually it was time to move back to Sweden. And ever since, I guess I, I just, you know, kept talking to Brooks throughout the years, you know, he, he came to work for Starbies and he asked me about it and he wanted to move to Sweden at one point and yeah, we stayed in touch. And, um, and then, like, about a year and a half ago, he just like, hey, Fred, um, what are you doing? 
And uh, he asked me, he had this idea. It's like, what do you think? It's like, oh, because I could see some of the stuff that, you know, it's not a game. It's a sport. Wow. This is, this is interesting what you're trying to do. And, and it's I was not, about, it's yeah. not just a game that's a sport, but it's also a platform and that, you know, Yes. So we're building a platform in addition to a game to play on that path platform and then possibly mm -hmm. some more games. I mean, it's, there's a lot of layers there. It's like an onion. It's like an ogre. Ogres have layers. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could get a serious headache by just thinking about it. But yeah, it's a, it's ambition. It's certainly it's a big idea. And it's like for me, it like combines a couple of different big, big, big components. One is obviously competitive games multiplayer games are you competitive are you, you a competitive can... gamer no i'm not no <laughs> I, I i have more love for making creating because i'm a creative guy more than just like oh there it is and i go to, and i want to compete and then i the if you want to see me really happy is when i talk to someone who have played the games that i worked on i've had that experience like out in asia like i meet i randomly meet people and we talk about games and they, you know, when they give you the, the love of having felt, you know, experienced that the stuff that you have done, that's amazing. I, I love that. But the, the, you know, playing games now, when, when, when I play games, I do play games, but it's always like you turn this into reverse engineering. It's like, that's cool. That's cool. I wonder how they, oh, okay. That's, that's, that's like, you see all the technology and you see like, you, 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 you yes, you get inspired, but also you get bored. Uh, and, and, and especially when you see some of them just repeat the same old formula, not pushing it. Uh, but yeah, the platform. Yes. Thank you for saying that. The platform sounds pretty boring. Yeah. But I think here is like, we, it's not just a platform. It's, it's a game. It's a platform where you have one type of game and other games attached to that platform. And those games can be different. They can be more specialized. Flow. What is that? This is Flow, this is me. This is me snowboarding. I love the feeling of being fully immersed in something like when you don't think about paying your bills, you don't think about like, you know, I don't know, boring things, uh, news, everything just disappears. You get like in the zone flow, you know, the, uh, it's a book by, uh, me, Ali six and me, how uh, it's pretty easy. It's like the foundation of making good games really. But flow for me is like, that. that's the type of games that I like. Um, when, well, I guess that, you know, some people get immersed in Excel, uh, poor people. But yeah, for me, it's like Amped, Tony Hawk, when you go, like, you go and you chain or like racing games that are, you have like a lot of speed. So like, you know, the, the, the design of the game needs to be taken care of. Like we need to remove clutter. We need to remove the distractions because you're not talking to the the, you know, the, the frontal cortex of the player. You're talking to the, you know, the deeper parts of the brain the subconscious you don't want to overdo that so you want to remove a lot of shit and that's how you, you like induce flow um i think but that doesn't mean like all the games that you can com compete in needs to be about flow but that's more me that's the games that i like that's that you know and um yeah amped two not amped one not amp three amp two had some, you know, there was something going on with controls, and the cameras, and the the character that was just like, ooh, I loved it. Um, but yeah, I, um, I don't know what was the question. I got excited. I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> what is that game where you just roll around and pick up things, and it gets bigger and bigger? Is it Daikatamari? That's what you remind me of. Like you just Ooh. kind of roll around the earth with your curiosity and you know, Oh, this is interesting. I'm going to go pick this up. I'm going to roll over here and I'm going to pick mm -hmm. that up. That's what you remind me of. Just your curiosity is Ooh. probably the greatest tool and weapon that you have. Um, I want to share with you a comment from the YouTube chat. 
that says, firstly, I'd like to say a huge congratulations on the artwork behind the aspects. They're wonderful. I'd like to know what was your main inspiration for that artwork? Oh, yeah. Who? my God. So way back when, even like in the 90s, like I mentioned like I'm looking at these uh, super expensive tools like the Silicon Graphics computers. Um, there's software called Maya or the alias Wavefront before that and Wavefront. Sorry, this is boring. But around the time where Maya was introduced, the first version, or there they had like a they had a, a tool called Paint Effects. You could draw strokes like this. That was a nerves curve. And along the nerves curve, you would actually spawn stuff, different stuff like crystals. You could spawn trees. They would grow out. They would like it just like so when I saw that and I, I got fed, I also this is probably because I'm curious I, I get I don't have a lot of um, patience <laughs> yeah so I get bored easily that's you know uh, but the uh, this thing was like amazing because like I could draw that and like ooh I would see stuff grow and that's pretty awesome that you, you know you can create and so once you have done that you had all those parameters on the side you know a gazillion of them. And, but eventually you would figure out, oh, okay, I can change the, the width of the stroke. I can change how many leaves you have on the thing and this and this. So those, those are the foundations of like parametric design. You know, this is like how you build architecture today. It's like you, you just like, I'm going to build a skyscraper and you, you fill it with stuff because it's just parameters. It's like computer system. So I had like we had that. And, and from there on, I was always curious about like, how do we, how do we build the systems that, you know, are dynamic? You can poke at it. You can like, you can inject a, 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 an idea, a thought, or like you, you can take two things and you can crash them and, you know, something else happens like generatively. And, but I mean, that, that's the, that's where we were uh, back then. And it's been like part of like something that I always wanted to explore too. And now, um, we talked about these, you know, we're going to do NFTs. And I'm like, all right, okay, monkeys and stuff. I'm not dissing those. I, I love them. I think they're, you know, some people, they, they hate them. They, it's like, it's not art. I think it's art. I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's just like some people just don't get it because uh, they fuck with people, you know. But it, it's cheap. The way that those systems, you know, the systems that you, you, you create to, to build them, they, they can be very... Now you just like uh, you buy you buy this you know macro for Photoshop and you build like a couple of kind of stupid things and boom you have ten thousand things and it's, so it's cheap but I you know and I I didn't want to do that and, and we talked about like the um, you know the story that Micah has you know built the whole lore and it's like deep and we have all those characters and stuff like it needed we needed something. That was not as cheap, I guess. That's something that was, you know, maybe a little bit mysterious, a little bit more abstract. Because if it's too literal, like, um, then you get into this monkey, um, or you know how a lot of NFTs tend to be like. Stupid Stop hats picking and on shit. the monkeys! We didn't want to do Stop that. picking on the monkeys! Well, no, think I, about it. I mean, art. I love them. I like anything it, yeah. creative, whether it's art or liter literature. I mean, it's all very subjective, right? Because it has to do with personal taste yes. and how people see things. Andy Warhol made a fortune and became so famous for fucking pictures of soup cans. Prince. You know? And, and yeah, he I didn't know. even create the soup can label. So, yeah, there's there's something yeah. for everybody. Uh, the same guy, Stilty, who complimented about the artwork said mm -hmm. that generative art is very fascinating to him. So maybe we'll have a whole conversation yeah. someday about generative art. But oh. let's let's get back to what you do at C9. Like, what's what's an average day like for you? What are the kind of things that I mean, besides meetings, like what are those conversations about? What do you actually do? Because when you're in charge of mm -hmm. art 
and games. I mean, that's a pretty broad spectrum. So what do you do kind well, of day to day, yeah. basically? Well, the first thing that we had to do, like it, it, that, I mean, it changes. We're a startup. Like, you know, you, you get curveballs every day. And so you, it's always different. Always, you, you cannot plan what's going to happen. Well, some things you can plan, I guess, like 50% of your day you can plan. And I get stuff done. But the first thing that we had to do, and this is why I'm hesitant to talk about being head of a games thing, because I'm not that good. But the I'm good at seeing what we lack and what we need, like zooming out. This is, I think, that all the accumulated experience from having been like both at small, shitty startups and 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 big corporations and 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 that experience. I I felt like we need someone who is really like we need a, a proper game designer, and we brought one. Yeah, so. Yeah, you know, I think he's been with us like for six months. I guess we're going to meet him later, Mark. But he's he's awesome. So he is like, you know, um, really leading the, um, the, 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 the first couple of games that we're building, very systemic and looking at the movement and like ha- being very organized. I'm not that organized, even though I have all my post-its and stuff. But I also lack the, like I said, the... the uh, um, the ability to stay focused for too long, but no, I, so what I do is like, I, I, every day, mostly I talk with Mark and I have like, we're building, so we're building a team, we're building a core team. And Mark was the first one. Uh, maybe not. I brought some other people also with, um, a background from Ubisoft and like friends that you trust and, and, and have the same sort of like attitude mentality but curio- being curious about making games but also understanding um the pitfalls and what to avoid and shit so there's like a lot of talking with them like we're spread you know from from Mon- from outside montreal to mark is on a sail sailboat in the mediterranean i think he's moving back to berlin over the over the winter, but he was on a sailboat, like sailing That's around. That's the life, isn't it? Stuff. That is the dream. I'm just going <laughs> to live wherever I want to, even if it's a boat, mm-hmm. and I'd still be able to do my dream yeah. job. Yeah. Life goals. Hashtag mm-hmm. life goals. Yeah. Well, well it, sounds, it sounds pretty exciting, but his internet is kind of shit. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to when he actually gets back to Berlin. Um, but yeah, it means it's, is that like, it's talking to people, making sure that me and Micah, you know, sort out like the lore and the things and, you know, the, 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 the meta platform, the, you know, the game of games, designing that being part of that. And also like trying to get the, uh, the, the, the first game that we're doing, um, making sure that we nail that, you know? And so there's a lot of things, interviews with new people, trying to trying to bring experienced people into crypto games. It's not is that's a challenge because there's so there's a lot of skepticism regard like around, you know, uh, crypto games. I think this is the, this is why we us talking about the platform and the games and how we, you know, the big ideas of providing good games for free on the game side this is a challenge because it's such a new concept it's such a big idea that is like you know it, it takes some convincing but those who actually have joined i think they see the big picture they see what we want to do we want to change a lot of things you know um so here's here's another question for you some- from the youtube chat channel why do you think most of the right. big companies have this corporate structure that limits creativity? Do you think it's because of the budget in mind or too risky to go for such decisions? I, I'll tell you, like straight up, I've worked at big companies and small scrappy startups. I will pick the small scrappy startup every time. Less yeah. red tape. Uh-oh, um, he's writing a post-it note, folks. No. But obviously, no, obviously it's, it has to do with business. You know, all businesses are there to make money, especially if you're public, you know, you need to make money. 
Uh, and so making games is a risky business. We know that, you know, had I been, had I, had I been at Disney when I, we bought Lucas, um, when they bought Lucasfilm, I probably would have canceled LucasArts too, because it was kind of because of the way that it was structured. Yeah. Not because of the people, but because of the, the setup, they were stuck in that, you know, but, you know, something happened when Disney bought them. Somebody was fired. You know, you can go check up who, who that was. Um, but a lot of people left, you know, before that. Mm, anyways, uh, I think Steve Jobs said, toner heads. He, he said this about Xerox, why Xerox failed. Because they had been making money by selling, you know, toner. And how do you incentivize people? Well, you know, you give them more money for being, you know, you, you bring in more business, you, you, you bring in more cash to the business. And so you're promoted. And that happens year in, year like After a while, all the people are, that are promoted um, are toner heads. They know how to sell stuff, but they don't know how to invent new shit. Do you remember Ericsson? You know, they made phones back in the day, even. And I don't know if it's true or not, but the, the story goes that Steve Jobs wanted to see if Ericsson could help develop it, the, 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 the phone, the iPhone. And they said, no, our business model is making phones with buttons. Yeah, I know it wouldn't surprise me, but that's like that's how you fail when the market changes and a new invention comes. And I don't care if Steve Jobs was an asshole, but he could see that people wanted better. He could see that there's a whole new different thing. Maybe because he had like, everybody knows like back in the 60s and the 50s, they were talking about these new things, you know, even I think 40, 48 was when, what's his name, was talking about cybernetics and how we would all have Facebook and be manipulated and be, you know, digital zombies. That was 1948. If you're hiring for somebody on your team, what skill set are you looking for? Well, the, the skill set starts with the right mindset, you know, you know, being, being curious means that you're willing to learn because the, the, the one thing that you can know for certain is that shits will change always. You know, I think I've been through pre-rendered real time, uh, and then this shit comes and fucks it up, you know, and then there's another, it's like, and like you think that making a game on the 360 would be similar to the next generation, but hey, it's not because you have so much more, that everything just changes and, and you need to like reinvent yourself and how you think about making shit uh, constantly. So the, 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 I, when I entered, like when I started, I think, uh, you know, the first gig I had in the industry, I was like, what, can't we just like, make a new story or like this like i was kind of naive i didn't i like you know i've learned this now let's use the what we've learned it's like it's not happening it's like always changing so the mindset is the most you know important thing practice uh, or look for you know I, I and obviously it needs to like overlap with what your interest is also um i would want to learn how to code uh, I'm. I don't have the patience for it. I would look. I would want to be one of those art directors that could paint beautiful shit. I can't do that because my background is, you know, it's architecture. It's like being constructing things and thinking in systems and and knowing what makes a good like uh, beautiful um, experience. You know, interactive, not static. Static is boring. But. The, the, you know, some things I think that is, is happening, like one of the big things that I see us adopting is like generative stuff, you know, uh, we're playing with Houdini, like uh, proceduralism, Blender, Bl we use Blender when we did the, uh, the, the NFTs, you know, the nine, they're, 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 they're using a system in, in Blender uh, called geometry nodes, which is basically like visual coding. And I suck at it, but I since because I had the experience with the paint effects and the parametric stuff, I could devise like a system for it. Like, 
well, if we do this and this, we have all those layers. And then we just need to figure out who is like what the, this family is like. This family is the angry shape family and the, the architect is the square fucking guy uh, or girl. I don't know, but it's like a boxy thing. But, you know, if you look closely, you will see that everything is slightly fucked up, too, uh, which is part of the story, I think. Uh, but yeah, the Blender is a free software. It's you know, and the geometry nodes are amazingly powerful. Unreal Five is is also like a game changer. Like the I, you know, I talked about using reflections on Splinter Cell like twenty years ago. Uh, now we have like real time global illumination. If you don't know what that is, Google it. But it's amazing. It's like simulating how how light actually bounces around in 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 in, in the environments. Yeah. So that that's like you know, and a couple of other things that uh, Epic's done too. Uh, so I mean, like if you want to make games, get started with um, Unreal Five, and definitely check out Blender. Um, coding, like we were, I was I was deeply inspired when we when we were doing the NFTs. I was looking at um, a project called Shader Toy. Uh, it's uh, a couple of guys who've been working at both Lucasfilm and uh, at Pixar. And they, they 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 do render stuff with just by writing code like math. It's insane. It's incredible. Shader toy. Look at yeah. You know, um, and that was also like one of the modern inspirations, like from like the paint effects and the system stuff and the story that Mike has created and and then the uh, you know all the that the, the the technology. You know the the. The goal would have been, or the ultimate NFT would have been to actually do it just like in code, not pre-rendered like we did. Oh, by the way, I wonder if people know that there's a beat to the NFTs, to the nine. There's a loop. It's 240 frames. It's eight seconds long. So the beat per minute is 60 or 120. We didn't. We didn't have time to do it. We didn't have time to actually do the sound design, but if somebody wants to do it, go ahead. Just saying, there's a beat. There's a beat in the NFTs. You can see it. That's interesting. That's Sorry. very interesting. Is there anything yeah. else that you want to talk about before we take off? Before we sign off here? I can I talk for days. Know. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you I can. But it's it, it it's fun. It's fun. I um, I look I look forward to to interact with more people and and actually you know like I said get the other perspective and like do a bit of co creation like see what like is this cool is this cool and get out of our own heads. You know? I just it's I I so know important. that you know when I interact with you, no matter how mundane the conversation starts out, like your passion. Mm -hmm. about what you do and what we're building and about the team. Like it just shines out and you are such a good advocate for us and always very interested in what the community's thinking, um, what you, what we think they might think about something. And I appreciate that, especially as a community person. That it's not, you know, I've I've had jobs in the past where it's just like you just go do this thing, um, tell them what you're supposed to tell them, and they're gonna you know, they're gonna eat this banana and like it. And I really appreciate that you don't have that mindset. Um, and I I love your curiosity and all of the stuff that that you wrangle. So now play, yes, play is free. It should be free. So any any parting words? Like, what's the best career advice you ever got? One guy who taught me the word monster fuck also taught me don't look down. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's a career advice, but I guess, like, don't, you know, in school I had a teacher, an old guy, this is like architecture, he said, look up look at the look around you because we're looking at architecture and be inspired by the world. And, um, and 
I don't know, career career advice is, is really tricky today because we're all working from home and like how do you meet people? I don't know. Like I'm I think I've been like so lucky, so fortunate to have, you know, met all the people I have. Um, that I can today work from the same place where I started with 3D, you know, 30 years ago. And, and now I work, you know, we, we span from Spain, Sweden to Portland, and uh, San Francisco and Montreal. And it's pretty awesome. I, but yeah, how do you get there today? I, I don't know. But, you know, I guess be prepared for change because shit is changing always. So and there's there's nothing I think I wouldn't be like scared about that. Because I think every change brings an opportunity. So see, seek out like, you know, a lot of people now are like worried about, oh, AI is going to draw or, you know, they were going to be, be re replaced by AI. Uh, but no, I think, you know, 100 years ago, you had doctors counting red blood cells by hand. You know, do you have a, today you, you have machines. And I think, is there a lack of doctors today? No. <laughs> certainly they're high in demand so i think you know look for the next opportunity like what does change bring um that's the best i can do and indulge your I curiosity guess. you know th there's that saying curiosity killed mm -hmm. the cat but curiosity fuels the fred i think too <laughs> i love it well cats have nine lives yeah okay all right well Thank you, everybody who showed up for the live stream today. We'll have the video on demand ready later. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and join our Discord so we can talk with you every day, all the time. Anyway, thank you so much, Fred. This was a lot of fun. Have a good night.